Ireland is a divided island, long divided by religion and therefore by troubles. Only in Dublin and in the south, in the Republic of Ireland, do our co-religionists there call themselves Unitarians. We took their words of welcome as our own this morning. In the north, especially around Belfast, even if you join the Baha'i faith, I was told, you're likely to be asked, well, that's well and good, but are you a Catholic Baha'i or a Protestant Baha'i? <laughs> and so throughout Northern Ireland, our spiritual kin call themselves non-subscribing Presbyterians. Although descended from the Scots Presbyterians that Cromwell brought over to conquer and settle the island in the 1600s, like our forebearers here in America, they rebelled against the Calvinist notion of predestination and so refused to subscribe to the dogmatic Westminster Confession of Faith. I visited them in 1997. The troubles that had been ongoing for decades were marked by IRA bombings, you'll recall, provocative Protestant marches through Catholic neighborhoods, and British troops often overreacting in the attempt to create order and making more martyrs. It was the weekend before Easter, and I was to preach in the town of Dromor, south of Belfast, before one of the largest of some 34 non-subscribing congregations. Their pastor, Reverend Angus McCormick, was my counterpart as the temporary head of the whole denomination, and his wife and he were hosting myself and my wife, Gwen. We spent Saturday with them visiting lovely old Down Cathedral nearby, where St. Patrick is said to be buried and retelling some of the legends about him. And then, after dinner back at the manse, we turned on the telly to listen to the evening news and learned that that evening, the firebrand Protestant fundamentalist preacher-politician Ian Paisley had so stirred up a Protestant crowd that they had gone out and tried to set fire to a Catholic church and burn it. Angus and I were simply appalled. And that night I slept pretty fitfully. I knew that the sermon that I'd prepared for the next morning would just have to be tossed aside. And that I'd be called to preach. Inspired by the Spirit, although uh, very conscious that sometimes the Spirit says to the preacher, you should have prepared more. But as best I recall, I began by speaking about my own Roman Catholic grandparents who came to America the way many Irish did, hungry, orphaned. They met and married in Chicago before World War I. And by the end of that war and the influenza epidemic that followed it, they had birthed four children and buried them all. When the priest wouldn't come during the height of the pandemic to give last rites to his wife, my, who was also at the brink of death, my grandpa stopped going to church or having anything to do with religion anymore. My mother was born in 1920 and raised like my grandmother to continue going to church. Talk about faith in life itself. When I asked my grandma about her church going, she said, oh, Yanni, sometimes you know soul get empty. Faith small like mustard seed. But I go to church, I look around, I see people with worries and sorrows bigger than my own. I pray for them and with them. And then I come home and tell your grandpa, with no words, it's not good to be bitter and to help him be kind and generous as he is. That's why I go to church. 
I then told the good people of Dremore that it was within their power to choose to be a transformative community in a time of trouble. And to remember that the core of the message that Jesus preached on his way to Jerusalem was love the ground of your being with all of your heart, mind, and soul. And then love your neighbor as yourself. And that we needed to set aside every idolatrous temptation to regard only those of our own faith, blood, or soil as holy. And to see the spark of the divine in every other human being seeking, as we do, for the right way in life. Now, God knows I'll never pretend to take credit for it myself, nor, nor would Angus or the non-subscribers. I think maybe it was simply fatigue over too many decades of troubles as a cycle of revenge following revenge, but the year following turned the tide in Northern Ireland. Irish-American former U.S. Senator George Mitchell did much of the negotiating. And the troubles finally ended in what is now called the Good Friday Agreement. Our co-religionists in Ireland were four square behind it and are still there with the four square testimony on behalf of peace, built on equity and justice. Which is, by the way, what the Hebrew word shalom really means. Not a cheap or easy peace. One worked out with persistence, patience, nonviolence, until finally those who have been demonized as enemies can again be seen as neighbors who need our love and are capable of being friends. Let's pause for a moment before I tell another story. A little Danny boy there, Gary.
all around this planet, there are places of trouble, not always on the telly. I think of Central Africa, where my own family, again, has some experience of the ongoing violence there. When I was 16 and an exchange student in Italy, my family welcomed Suleiman Kakosa, a Muslim from Uganda, to take my bedroom, my house, and live with my parents and younger brothers. It's a small town in Michigan, and he was the first person of color, I was told, much less the first Muslim that that town had ever, as one hate message my parents received, been allowed to stay overnight. He rose before dawn to pray. He kept Ramadan. And he went back to Uganda and finished the university and became a teacher, a science teacher, at the country's most prestigious high school until he disappeared almost certainly killed by his fellow Muslim, Idi Amin, who went after the educated and those who had ties to the West. And I dedicate my remarks to Suleiman today. May he rest in peace. Of course, the most troubled place on our minds today is Gaza where 30,000 have died, mostly Muslims, and children, women, in the Israeli reaction to the horrific attacks of October 7th. Polarizing opinions have come even to places like Petaluma by this. But let me say this. I've been to Israel, Palestine five times over the last four decades. One is the honorary president of the World Conference on Religion and Peace where I opened the world assembly of that body in Amman, Jordan, when we couldn't meet in Jerusalem, ironically, the city named for peace, for fear of causing an outbreak of violence. I've never been inside Gaza itself. That's hard to arrange. But I've been in the nearby Israeli town of Zderot, where I found every home had to have a safe room, a bomb shelter, due to the Hamas rockets. I've been in the homes of Jewish families descended from those who came to Israel as refugees from violence elsewhere. Not just from the Holocaust, but also from Arab countries that expelled their Jews after the UN created the State of Israel the year after I was born. And why did the UN do that? Well, perhaps out of guilt that the United States itself and the UK and other Europeans and even our wartime ally, the Soviet Union, had treated Jews so badly throughout the last century that they needed a refuge. Israel then should be seen in no small part as itself a refugee camp although it's become a rich one now and powerful and nuclear armed and a fragile democracy like our own, as imperfect a government as our own, with its internal politics a mess, and with the descendants of those who founded the state, not many of them living here in Silicon Valley or elsewhere in the West, having left its future to those families who fled Arab countries or Russia, where many of them were never allowed to learn the moral code and core of their own religious tradition and became embittered toward the Arab nations that expelled them. The most pious try to revive Jewish piety as it was practiced in 18th century Poland. Yet, without good people, both religious and secular, striving together for peace, 
there is no transformation, except here and there. I think of a place called Open House. If you fly into Israel, you'll land at Ben Gurion Airport, which is halfway between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, and right next to the town of Ramla, once an Arab village, where the oldest houses, beautifully surrounded by olive and lemon trees, were owned by Palestinian Muslim families during the long years of Ottoman rule and even thereafter. In 1948, when four surrounding Arab countries all attacked Israel, rather than accept the UN decision to partition the land between a Palestinian and Jewish state. The family of one of these houses fled, perhaps to Gaza. Now, just as Jews recall the Holocaust, Palestinians speak of that kind of displacement as the Nakba, the catastrophe. The refugee camps that sprang up in Gaza and Jordan and Lebanon seethed with anger. While the abandoned house itself was taken by the new Israeli government and given to a family that had survived the Holocaust in Bulgaria and come as refugees. My friend Dalia, Dalia Landau, grew up in that house. And when her parents died and she inherited it, she was tremendously moved when Arab Israelis related to the former owners came to quietly pay their respects and to see where their own grandparents had fed them olives and pistachios and hummus and pita and baklava and dates and so much more at the feast that ended Ramadan, the Eid al Fitr. Dalia and her husband Yehezkel, an American Jew who graduated as I did from Harvard Divinity School, were leaders in an Israeli movement called Oz Shalom, Strength Aiming for Peace. They pondered what to do with the house, and after months, no years actually, of negotiations with descendants of the one-time Arab owners, they agreed to rename it Open House and make it a place where Jews and Arabs from childhood could come and learn one another's humanity, their languages, customs, and perspectives, and to work together for peace with justice. It too is still ongoing. And even in times of trouble, I think it is possible to feel called to transform those troubles toward peace and justice. It's true not only far away, it's true right here. When a congregation like this one leads the faith communities of the city to ring out danger over the epidemic of gun violence, when UUP supports its low-income and Hispanic neighbors in resisting eviction and promoting more low-income housing through the North Bay Organizing Project, when members of this congregation stand up for LGBTQ perspectives being included in schools and libraries, this too is an open house. May our efforts to renovate it make it more open than ever to more folks more often for more community building purposes. And may those efforts bear good fruit this month, even if it means a bit of sacrifice, a bit of fasting or staying at home to raise the funds to make it so. In the back of our hymnal, there is nestled between a Jewish prayer for peace and a Muslim prayer for the same purpose, these words. Save us from weak resignation to violence. Teach us that restraint is the highest expression of power. 
that thoughtfulness and tenderness are the mark of the strong. Help us to love our enemies, not by countenancing their sins, but by remembering our own. And in that spirit, let's build a strong future for this congregation and a strong home for its values in all the years ahead. So may it be.